Um, hello and welcome to everyone who is joining the British Sporting Arts Trust this afternoon for our online lecture series. We're very grateful to Jamie Roundtree from Roundtree Tryon Galleries for gener generously sponsoring these lectures and who has very kindly agreed to sponsor our next series of talks. The link to their website can be found below and also on the British Sporting Arts Trust website. Today, we are delighted to welcome Claudia Pfeiffer. Claudia is Deputy Director and George L. Orstrom Jr. Curator of the National Sporting Library and Museum in Middleburg, Virginia. Claudia has over 25 years of extensive knowledge and experience in fine art and exhibitions with her primary focus being on research, design, interpretation, writing, and the installation of loan and permanent exhibitions. Over the last 10 years at the National Sporting Library and Museum, she's curated over 30 exhibitions. Her projects include Munnings Out in the Open, A Brief History of Black Horsemen in Racing, Part of the Pack, The Hunt at Petworth by Colin Barker, Photography, the Chronicle of the Horse in Art, and finally a sporting vision, the Paul Mellon Collection of British Sporting Art from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Details of these exhibitions can be found on their website. Currently, the museum is showing highlights from their permanent collection. This emphasizes the growth and diversification of the National Sporting Library and Museum's art collection and audience over the past decade. In addition to the above work, Claudia has a special interest in professional photography of two and three dimensional works, lighting and image post-processing. And as a result of lockdown has begun to develop online tours through her learning of high resolution 360 degree imagery. Welcome Claudia. I'm sure I'm not alone in saying how excited we are to hear about the museum and your involvement. It will be fascinating for our audience to hear how the museum has evolved and how you see it moving forward. At the end of Claudia's lecture, we'll have time for your questions and answers, and I will endeavor to get through as many as we have time for. Thank you very much. My name is Claudia Pfeiffer. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I'm looking forward to sharing our material with you this morning. Uh, you'll notice behind me the uh, photograph of our campus. This is the National Sporting Library Museum in Middleburg, Virginia. We're about 60 miles west of Washington, D.C. to give you some idea. We are known for being in the middle of horse and hunt country. So we have some lovely uh, farms out here in our, our uh, vicinity. You'll notice behind my right shoulder here the library building. And to my left is the museum. The museum was uh, renovated and expanded. Originally, it's an 1804 federal house. Uh, and we have about 13,000 square feet for the museum and the structure. The library was built in 1999. But our organization goes much further back than that. The library was founded in 1954 by four fox hunters, uh, George Orstrom Sr., Alexander McKay Smith, Lester Caro, and they invited Fletcher Harper to become president in 1954. So uh, we've had a few different locations prior to the building of the library structure, which was in 1999 when it opened. And it was designed to look like a carriage house um, for the property, uh, the, the historic property. So I'm gonna take you into the galleries now. So I, uh, in the introduction, um, the mention was made about our 360 degree photography. I uh, did take the opportunity during the lockdowns to learn how to do stitched photography. So these are constructed from about 42 separate photographs with a panoramic head. And we are in the first floor of the museum right now. And I'm gonna scroll around to introduce you to Stillwater here. So some of you might be familiar with the 30-foot uh, sculpture that's at Marble Arch by McFiddian Green. We have a nine-foot version of that that greets our visitors when they enter the museum. It's made of sheets of lead, and it has uh, copper rivets that hold the sheets in place to a fiberglass frame on the inside. And there's a metal dowel that goes through the center of the piece and sits in a hole in the oak beams to keep it upright. Uh, it's a really striking piece and it's something that people remember when, remember when they've come to campus. 
<clears throat> so down the hallway into the historic wing, you enter the first art gallery here. And we took the opportunity to put together um, some of the pieces that were by women artists in the uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, Claudia. Okay. Thank Are you. you to now? Thank you. Okay. Let's move back then. Thank you for your patience, everyone. I apologize. Okay, so this is the sculpture by Nick Fidian Green. That is in the square at Marble Arch. As I mentioned, nine feet tall, sheets of lead. It's a very striking piece. So we are, again, in the gallery featuring our uh, a good number of the women artists that we have in our collection. Uh, we'll start with Jean Bowman here. So some of you might be familiar with Jean Bowman. She was a founder of the American Academy of Equine Art. Uh, she started illustrating for the Chronicle of the Horse, which is a, an American publication that's been in print since 1937, focusing on equestrian activities uh, that's published weekly. Uh, by the time that uh, she was made president of the American Academy of Equine Art, she had a decades long experience behind her in being an equestrian portrait painter. And we have this wonderful piece that came to the collection fairly recently. Uh, uh, this was painted in 1963 and it features the Eglinton Hounds, which is a Canadian hunt. And she's known for this uh, crop in her signature there. Another highlight of this gallery is a uh, work by Marie Rosalie Bonner, a French artist who gained quite a bit of acclaim in, in the 19th century. And as a, as a female painter uh, working in the arts uh, was successful in her own right. And so this is a study of lions. She uh, spent a lot of time in zoos uh, observing animals. And this is a study for some of the larger paintings that she created of lions. This here is by Susan Catherine Moore Park Water. She was a contemporary of Rosa Bonner working in the United States. And she also in her lifetime under her own name and signing with her own signature became quite successful as an animal artist in her, in her time. This uh, wonderful study of an Irish trout steam is by Edith Enine Somerville who uh, was a Derrydale a press uh, artist who had print reproduction. She wrote a wonderful series of books that were illustrated that are part of our library collections as well. All right, I'm going to take us into the next gallery. Okay, so here we have over the mantelpiece is a painting by Edward Troy. Now, Edward Troy was a British artist who uh, was unable to find a strong interest in his artwork in Britain and immigrated to the United States in 1823. It was a really uh, op an opportune time for him to come to the United States. He was trained as an animal painter. And in the US, the uh, equestrian industry was re-emerging after the War of 1812. And there were really no um, uh, refined horse painters uh, in, the, in the country working at the time. So he really fit a niche in terms of being able to come and start to document all of these amazing race horses that were being bred in the United States and that were really a focus on creating a racing industry that was uniquely American and not um, uh, relying less and less on British imports. And so this is a painting of American Eclipse. Uh, he was brought out of retirement in the 1820s to run a series of match races. And this culminated in a race in, uh, at the Union Race Course, which was the first prepared turf track here in the States. And he ran against Henry. And to give you some uh, idea of how popular racing had become again here by then, there were 60,000 spectators, which was approximately the population of New York State at the time. Uh, so 
really important document of early American racehorses. So he would paint original commissions for um, uh, horse owners, trainers, et cetera. And then there were art um, magazines like the Spirit of the Time and the American Turf Register that would reproduce these works as illustrations um, for uh, to be read in the magazines and to document the bloodlines of the different um, racehorses. <clears throat> So you might be wondering what this is, maybe some folks recognize it, but this is a weather vane of a fox here. Now we have 11 weather vanes in the National Sporting Library and Museum's collections. And these uh, came to us by bequest from Paul Mellon, who you might be familiar with from the Paul Mellon, excuse me, Paul Mellon Center. And as the, <clears throat> the guiding light of the Yale Center for British Arts here in the United States. Uh, Paul Mellon's farm, Rokeby, where he uh, bred thoroughbreds, is right outside of town here. And he was very much a member of the community here in Middleburg. Uh, this is a 19th century fox weather vane, three-dimensional structure. Now, uh, Paul Mellon is so integral in terms of what is the public repository and images that we have access to here in the United States with the Yale Center British Arts Collection and the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts Collection in Richmond. Uh, when he, um, before he passed away as a member of the community, it, our organization was still a library and he was very much involved with us in that regard. Um, when he passed away, he bequeathed the, uh, the weather vanes to us. We have a sculpture and a painting by him as well. <clears throat> So this bronze is by Herbert Hazeltine, uh, international, internationally known sculptor who did a series of bronzes called the British Champion Animals. There are 19 sculptures in total that he fulfilled. Uh, he was really, really intrigued by the idea of a perfect model of a thoroughbred and spent decades of his life reworking and reworking and reworking this idea. His first version was an oversized uh, piece that he created. And in that idea as a, a marketing piece really. Um, and then he continued to rework this piece from 1912 through to 1949, which is what we're looking at here. And he referred to this one as the perfect thoroughbred. In other words, that he got to the point where he felt he had finally captured the perfect composite of a thoroughbred in sculpture. Uh, these are favorites of visitors to the museum. These are by Gustav Mus Arnold, who uh, was an animal artist in the 19th century. These are studies for a larger work that he did of the need at Meadowbrook. And that's in the Brooklyn Museum of Art, excuse me, the Brooklyn Museum's art collection. And all of these individual portraits are uh, repeated in the final composition. Here we have one that uh, often people remember when they come to the National Sporting Library Museum. This is by John M's, Foxhounds and Terrier in a Stable Interior, 1878. This is a quite large example of these kennel interiors. John M's was a fox hunter himself. And as we all know, the best sporting artists are very much involved in the sporting activities that they participate in. And he spent a lot of time behind the scenes, getting to know the huntsmen, getting to know these particular personalities of all of these hounds and that terrier there in the composition. You really get the sense of that he knew each individual animal. And this is another painting by John M's here, Gone to Ground, a gray hunter with fox, hounds, and terrier, 1887. And you'll note the terrier there retrieving the fox. This is a, just going to give you sort of the, the front view of this before we go into the next gallery. Uh, the next object I'll be talking about is our Sterling Silver Park drag.
So here it is, uh, very much a highlight of, uh oh. Very much a highlight of the collection. It's 49 inches wide. It's made of English sterling silver. Uh, it's a park drag, which uh, refers to the design of the coach. Uh, it looks like a road coach, but is a smaller uh, version of that. Uh, it's circa 1910. And the hackneys were made by the lost wax process so that you get the individual characteristics of, the, um, of each hackney there. The carriage itself is made from sheet silver. The wheels are separately cast pieces that you'll note here. You'll see the brake underneath the carriage there, which is the park drag. Um, it also has a hand brake, which is located here. Uh, and in also to, of note is this basket in the foreground here, which is hand braided sterling silver wire. Uh, the coat, the horn itself is a separately cast piece um, as is the whip. Uh, this is a really interesting, uh, has an interesting provenance in the idea that uh, it was made in circa 1910, but the uh, assay marks for this are circa 1950, uh, or are actually from 1950. A uh, gentleman by the name of George Mossman saved this wonderful object um, from being smelted, and it was assayed at that time. Now, you'll note that it is on a um, a wooden base here, and it has a key, and that is because that's actually a carrying case. Now, I mentioned it's 49 inches long. It's on a marble base. It's quite heavy, so uh, the carrying case is designed for it to be carried around. Why would one carry such an object around? Well, it is a uh, tabletop banquet centerpiece, and that speaks really to the idea of who might want to have something like this made. It came to the National Sporting Library and Museum with the lore that it was commissioned by or made for Alfred Gwyn Vanderbilt himself, and he was famously a coachman as well as a, a, a very esteemed businessman who uh, worked in the United States and in Britain, lived in Britain. And he uh, was really integral in a, an amazing time period in Britain before World War I, uh, when the International Horse Show started having uh, international level competition of these road coaches and park drags as part of the spectacle that was the International Horse Show. And the first iterations of these uh, were, uh, the first version was the, um, the coaching marathon, which was 11 and a half miles long. And you can imagine the spectacle of these um, you know, dozens of carriages that needed to switch horses at least three or four times over the course of the race. So very much covered within uh, the context of international sport. And sadly, in July of 1914, uh, the uh, conscription of horses for World War I led to the collapse of the coaching heyday. But this is a really uh, just a, 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 a snapshot of time of the grandeur that was the carriage heyday before World War I. <clears throat> I'll give you a little sweeping view here of the galleries. We have uh, in our collection five black and white paintings by George Wright and this uh, color version here that's up on the, on the uh, pair here. Now, black and white paintings are also referred to as en grisaille, which I'm butchering it because I don't speak French, but it means in gray tones. And they would have been painted in black and white as a, a for illustration for a periodical. And they are show a series of images relating to, to fox hunts. And you'll notice here, we have the black and white version of the same painting in color above it on the right here. Uh, and you'll notice the difference in style that George Wright presents in the two techniques where the black and white images are much more tightly uh, painted and, and more of an illustrative quality to them. Uh, these would have been reproduced probably at least a half of the size of the painting, probably a quarter of the size. So it was really important to get these sharp details correct so that they reproduce properly. Where the color version of the painting is quite painterly and it has a very different feeling to it than uh, the other works that he created. We'll see the other two over here.
So contrasted against that is a 20th century painting, 21st century painting by Henry Kohler, Jockeys Between Races at Newmarket 2009. <coughs> Henry Kohler is regarded as one of the esteemed uh, painters who was uh, working in the equestrian um, uh, sporting painting tradition throughout his career and uh, had a decades long uh, uh, background in, in sporting art. Uh, he was an illustrator in New York City first and then uh, uh, made a concerted turn towards easel painting. His real claim to fame was that he uh, gained his first commission from the Kennedys and that set his career in motion. Uh, he was also one of the founding members of the American Academy of Equine Art, which I mentioned earlier. And I'm sure many of you might have actually known him. It was a really just a wonderful, wonderful gentleman and painter. So here we are. Here we are in the next gallery. So this beautiful piece is a, a screen by Clarice Smith, who sadly passed away a few months ago, but we had uh, an, an opportunity to do our first solo exhibition with a contemporary female artist with Clarice Smith a few years ago. Um, Power and Grace was the name of the exhibition. She and uh, Robert H. Smith, uh, moved to or um, uh, established a thoroughbred breeding program here uh, right next door to Paul Mallon's property actually uh, breeding horses and through that experience she started incorporating racing scenes into her dynamic range of contemporary art. Uh, she was a faculty at George Washington Un University for several years and uh, very much cross trained in different aspects of of art and she fused all of those different experiences together for a very unique, uh, really identifiable uh, a painting style. When you see a Clarice Smith, once you've seen one, you'll always recognize one. And she, in creating the screen, she really wanted to focus on the palette that she uh, presented here and the way that she would produce these uh, types of ideas in her racing imagery, she had, uh, racing periodicals from the 1970s, which are printed in black and white. And she would cut out the horse and jockey figures and use them as puzzle pieces really to move them around and come up with a, an approximation of a composition that was freed from any interference from uh, versions of color and color photography so that she could really focus on her ideas for the palette that she would use for them. Uh, you'll notice this beautiful uh, metal leaf uh, edition here, the, the dr drama of the dirt kicking up. And uh, gold leaf and metal leaf are notoriously difficult to, to move and, and to, to work with because it's so fine and air currents make it uh, float away. So these were really happy accidents in terms of how they um, ended up being laid on the bottom there, but it's really dramatic. And we had a really funny conversation about the sporting screen. So uh, you might be familiar with the decorative objects from the uh, 17th, and, excuse me, 18th and 19th century that were uh, large uh, screen dividers. Some of them had sporting topics. We have one in our permanent collection. And I'd asked her if she had made this screen smaller really to focus on it as an art object. And she said to me, no dear, I did it to cover up my television. So here we are again with the idea of art and um, practical ideas combining to make this uh, wonderful object that she donated to the collection after uh, the exhibition was over. Here we have just a charming small painting by Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate, American Ruffed Grouse, 1856. Tate was known uh, for a wide variety of sporting subjects, including these diminutive um, 
uh, works all the way up to large grand scale sporting scenes of a wide variety, everything from deer to cattle um, to um, hunting in, in marshes. This work here is by John Frederick Heron Jr. Three Horse Heads with Chicken and Rooster, 1875. And just a great example of his ability uh, to paint horses and livestock. These vignettes are also by John Frederick Heron Jr. One of them relates to fox hunting, the one above it. And the one below has, um, again, farmyard scenes. There's a, a mule, there's some pigs, chickens, horses, sheep, et cetera. And we have another great view of the park drag from the other gallery. Okay, I, I had gotten word that there is a Munnings exhibition planned in your corner soon. I, we have a, a art gallery, a gallery that we put together <clears throat> in the museum right now that focuses on the additions of Munnings to our permanent collection in the last 10 years. I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of these works. So one of my real fascinations with Munnings is um, his, his desire and yearning to be outside and to uh, paint from nature and paint from life. And he really uh, resisted um, going into the studio and only uh, spent time there as part of his commission work. Uh, we have examples in our uh, permanent collection of uh, works he really did as part of um, his, his passion for the subject matter. Uh, this one here is Under Starter's Orders at Newmarket, 1947. And you get the real sense of uh, the motion that he was trying to create. And really as an artist who was focused on the impression of the moment. These aren't particular jockeys necessarily or particular horses in that idea but it's that rush, the energy of the start that he's try, tried to capture in this. And he did over 30 versions of this painting um, in different combinations with the final one being in the Yale Center for British Arts collection. It's an oversized piece. And, and the big difference between that and this one is that the canvas is extended almost a third of the scale to the right with the um, open um, uh, area of grass that really gets the sense of motion as the horses are rushing into this negative space. <clears throat> it is really ironic that Munnings uh, considered himself a strong student of the, uh, the British landscape tradition and really uh, disconnected himself uh, from the Impressionist movement in Paris, considering how impressionistic he was. And we'll see other examples of that. So here is a work from 1917, <clears throat> Pertrons in, in, in a horse, in a, in a barn. So 1917 is during World War I. Munnings is, um, has the, his time period in Lamorna behind him. His first wife had passed away and he was, who tragically committed suicide. Um, but he was really ranging around what to do um, in this um, time period. And he, he tried to volunteer for the war effort on three separate occasions and was turned down the first two times because of an injury that he had. Some people aren't aware, but when Munnings was 20 years old, he lifted a hound puppy over a hedgerow and a thorn bush um, rebounded into his eye and actually blinded him in one eye. So pretty much all of the artwork that you see Munnings did with one eye. But because of that, he was uh, technically didn't qualify for the war effort. His third attempt to volunteer was writing a letter to Cecil Alden, who was a sporting artist and also was um, stationed at the Caldecott remount. 
And the letter went along the lines of from one horse person to another, you know that I can help in the war effort. And of course, um, Alden um, uh, thanked, um, um, had Munnings come to the remount where Munnings treated horses with mange. And there were so many horses being refreshed through the remount that the local barns were also being used to house these horses. And this is a painting of one of these barns. Here's a lovely example of in the stalls. Um, it's not dated. And this is, it came to us fairly recently in the, um, through the bequest of Catherine Becker. Munnings, uh, when he painted interior scenes, he preferred to, as was with the other example, um, to have a gray for a contrast uh, and to focus on the uh, uh, different the aspects of light and contrast and dark. And this is a, a wonderful example of that. And he was really known for his understanding of color and light and contrast and focusing on the moment at hand. Uh, this is another early painting by him uh, circa 1911 with shrimp here idling on the hillside in the rolling hills. Uh, for the summers in these um, early years, he would, uh, Munnings would basically uh, hire this this man by the, uh, who was nicknamed Shrimp because of his stature, who was really a wonderful horse uh, owner and, excuse me, horse trainer and rider. And he would ask him to dress in uh, uh, Roma attire and model for him um, when they were out in the open. And here he is uh, with the gorse and bloom and this pack of ponies. And they would literally set up on the spot outside and uh, paint in the moment. Sometimes if the weather changed, Munnings would change canvases to show the different types of weather and climate. And you'll notice this warm and vibrant uh, yellow gold uh, color in this one as opposed to the cooler uh, tones that we saw in the um, earlier examples. <clears throat> So here we have a winner at Epsom circa 1948. And this is so in this sort of the same time period as the painting that was over the mantelpiece that we looked at. And Munnings is towards the end of his career here. He's um, um, in this in 1948. He actually uh, he left the Royal Academy after a quite dramatic speech. Uh, relating to the modern art movement. I mentioned that he solidly aligned himself with the British landscape tradition and with traditional painting, realistic and representational painting. And he was uh, uh, made president of the Royal Academy in 1944. And after four years tenure, uh, decided um, to retire from his position. And in that time period, the Royal Academy had become solidly split between um, representational artists and the modern artists. And it qu caused a, quite a bit of tension between the two um, factions. And Monnings, again, as somebody who was uh, really railed against the ideas of, um, he was one of, he really was from an era of, um, you worked hard, you put the time in, being an artist was not an easy thing to do. Uh, you 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 studied and you you sketched and you uh, you learned from from experience. And he saw the modern artists as um, artists who didn't put that work in and didn't do the the elbow grease, as it were. And so, um, when he uh, gave his retirement speech at the Royal Academy, this was being broadcast over uh, the uh, the radio. And Munnings had a tendency to be very flamboyant and uh, expressive, and apparently he cursed, which of course is a big deal when you, and especially during this time period, to do that on the radio. So it caused a, quite a scandal when he when he retired, and um, definitely made an impact on the organization. But when you when you look at this painting and and the others that we've um, experienced so far. It's, it's really that irony that he didn't see himself as an impressionist. Uh, this jockey is not, again, a specific jockey. This horse is not a specific horse. It's a composite that he's created. The composition is something that he um, really imagined from his experiences as someone who spent a lot of time at the, at the races here at Epsom and in Newmarket. 
and he loved it. And this is something that he did um, as a subject matter from his own interest. And I like to uh, refer to the jockey here as the every jockey. It's that pivotal moment at the win when they, the, the, the horse and the rider, they are the focus of all of the attention. And you can see here all everyone sort of moving into the center of this, of this composition. So I previously um, mentioned Paul Mellon's connection to the National Sporting Library Museum. Uh, Mellon was famously painted by uh, Alfred von Engs and the painting is in the Yale Center for British Arts collection. Uh, so this is a reproduction of that particular painting of Paul Mellon on Dublin in 1933. Uh, he did study in England and uh, was an avid fox hunter, both in England here and in the United States. Uh, and famously this painting, some of you may be familiar with this story. Uh, when Mellon saw uh, the painting for the first time, he uh, really was not fond of the blasted oak that was in the background, which is such an iconic uh, view of a landscape in Britain. And I think it's one of the few times that Paul Mellon um, heard the word no because Munnings refused to change the composition. We also have uh, two prints by Munnings in our collection. So we have Devereux Milburn, 1924 on the left here, who's a famous uh, international high goal polo player uh, who uh, was part of the big four. The big four won a polo match at the International Cup for the first time with him being on that team. Munnings came to the United States for um, uh, in the in the 20s uh, for a year and had several commissions that were here in, in the States. Here we have um, another scene of the new market of new market. So the new market gallops. So in the same time period as the other two paintings that we discussed. And you'll see the this Epsom painting there in the other gallery again. This is a really uh, interesting space that's in our building. It is a, a transition gallery uh, between the new structure and the original house and has this beautiful um, arched ceiling that makes for a very intimate experience in um, interacting with the artwork. We have a sculpture display right now. Uh, we have a wonderful growing collection of Herbert Hazeltine sculptures. I mentioned the perfect thoroughbred earlier from 1949. And here we have some other examples by him, which really give a, a sense of the changes that he uh, went through in his stylistic interpretation of sculpture. When he started sculpting in 1902, his first um, work was a, a polo uh, composition. It was really realistic and very much inspired by the Anamaliere tradition. As he moved forward in his career, he really started to experiment with his style more and more. And we have two of these intermediate period examples here. So the Regina Doris here in the middle and the study of the horse head on the right. And I think it becomes obviously that he is playing with his surfaces. So the horse head here where he's taking balls of clay and not quite smoothing them out to create this rich texture and variation. And then looking at these uh, clean lines that he's starting to look to by um, the full culmination of his um, what he's known for on the left. Um, he referred to it as an Egyptian style. So he really focused on the idea of finding those bold, iconic, classic lines of confirmation. Any animal person who sees his sculptures really connects with them because they're very much um, authentic in the way that he approached um, the, the subject matter, but yet came up with what was essentially a 20th century representation that was very unique to him. The other aspect of it, you'll notice this broad variety of patinas here. I'm sure the foundries love to work with Hazeltine because he was meticulously involved in the finishing of his bronzes from everything from picking his own 
uh, quarry stones and the, the finest marbles that he could find. And then really playing with the patinas, whatever um, uh, surface treatments that might've been available, you might find one that would show a representation of that. I mentioned the Anomalier movement. Uh, the French Anomaliers, they really focused on in the late 18th and then into the 19th century on animals as fine art. And uh, the sculpture aspect of that is really uh, uh, driven home by a sculptor by the name of Antoine Louis Berry. And the bear bronze here in the cabinet is an example by him. This work here is by Pierre Lenorde, one of the um, French Anomalier sculptors, beautiful sculpture of the Marin Foal. And then we'll talk a little bit about this piece here. So on the right is a sculpture by John Skeeping. This is a Fort Marcy. This is one of the bequests that we received from Paul Mellon. Fort Marcy was Mel Mel one of Mellon's most financially successful uh, thoroughbreds <coughs> and a, a beautiful example of um, John Skeeping sculpture who was also a painter. <clears throat> And then I'd like to uh, just to, uh, do a brief overview of some of the paintings featured in this gallery. Uh, these are <laughs> mostly 19th century British works. Uh, we have three uh, paintings by Benjamin Marshall in the collection, which are featured here together. This is actually the first time we've shown them on view um, at the same time. I, the one on the right is another bequest by Paul Mellon, coincidentally. Um, the one in the center is by, uh, of Mr. Thomas Willen of Mary Bowen Park and Twyford Abbey, 1918. This is a, a work from his um, early period of portraiture. And you get again, the sense of uh, his really keen understanding of animal anatomy. It's really important for a sporting artist to be successful. And we talk about this, the idea that that artist needs to be refined in being able to paint a landscape, being able to paint an animal and be able to paint a human. And we get um, the sense of that in this composition. So this work here is Fighting Cox 1812. Um, to our 21st century understanding of sports, uh, this is definitely a subject matter that becomes a, 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 a one that we, we discuss in light of the idea that this is not something that people do anymore in the 21st century, but was very much a part of gentlemanly sporting experience um, into the 19th century. So these are dressed fighting cocks. Um, but again, you get the real sense that Benjamin Marshall understood the, um, the relationship these um, animals would have, what they looked like, their, um, their, the nature of the aspect of them. And here's a landscape of a horse from 1807. Uh, by John Bolpe, a British artist. We often get questions about uh, the physical changes that were made to these animals as were the dressed fighting cock as an example. And here we see you know, a horse with a dock tail that's quite extreme. And you notice these white scars here. Those are um, saddle scars. Uh, the, the docking of the tail to a certain extent was practical. Um, but ultimately in this iteration was a fashion statement. And uh, docking to the bone is definitely something that today to our eyes is not something that um, horse owners would like to see, but it was something that was part of the aesthetic of the time uh, and this bucolic landscape of the horse here. And then we'll end with 
a painting by Haywood Hard Hardy, Jean Racine, which is a, a lot of fun, really. I mean, you can see the chapel in the background here. You have the huntsman and his new bride here in her side saddle riding attire, and they are they've just gotten married and they're about to ride off into the sunset quite literally. So we have this um, bay here, Susan's chestnut here, who is outfitted with a side saddle, which is her mount. And then of course the gray here for the huntsman and all the excitement of the moment there expressed in the painting. So that is uh, a, an overview of some of the works that we have in our permanent collection. Thank you very much for uh, staying with me as I was having some technical difficulties this morning. Uh, I, I hope to see some of you on our side of the pond uh, in the near future and look forward to uh, meeting you in person. Uh, thank you. And I'm looking forward to any questions that um, you all might have. Uh, Claudia, thank you so much. Um, that was fascinating and um, uh, wonderful to hear. Um, I have um, a couple of questions. Um, one is, what is the oldest object in your collection? Depends on which collection we're talking about. So the art collection is a work by um, Abraham von Kalreit, who's a Dutch painter, and it's a landscape painting of a horse from 1690. If we're talking about our library book collection, uh, the earliest uh, work is a book on dueling from 1523. Uh, we also have uh, what is a little bit uh, earlier in the timeline, a, a small collection of prehistoric horse teeth. So, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, diverse, very diverse. That's lovely. Um, another question was, um, have you have you been to the Munnings Art Museum at Castle Hill? At Castle House, yes, actually. That was, I had a wonderful opportunity to uh, do an Addingham Trust program a few years back, uh, the Horse and the English Country House and the Munnings Museum was one of the stops there. And we had a wonderful experience at the museum. Uh, uh, Jenny Hand, who's the director there, uh, just was a wonderful, wonderful experience. So yes, I've been there. Um, and then um, what exhibitions uh, do you have planned uh, coming up? Our next exhibition, right now we have um, the, I mentioned the American Academy of Equine Art a few times in the presentation. Currently until March 20th uh, is the uh, 2020 hindsight, 40 years of the American Academy of Equine Art, uh, which focuses on the uh, evolution, the development, the evolution and the current membership of the American Academy. And then in June, we are organizing a uh, what essentially is an overview of the museum and celebrating its 10th anniversary uh, uh, as, a, as a, a, an excuse for focusing on the permanent collection that'll be throughout the entire building. And then in the fall, we are featuring an exhibition on uh, dog collars and uh, uh, canine art that's called um, Identity and Restraint, the Art of the Dog Collar, which we're doing in partnership with uh, the Museum of the Dog in New York City. And also a venue will be Pebble Hill Plantation in Thomasville, Georgia. Say so quite a lot, really. <laughs> um, I've just had a question come in that says, what would you take home from the museum if you were given free choice? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> We actually we have a we have a bucket list actually among my colleagues uh, the first house to check um, if something's missing. It as a curator it's always difficult to say one thing that is uh, the favorite thing, but I ultimately it's the sporting screen. If you were to yeah. if one thing would be missing, it would be the sporting screen by Claire Smith. I, I get that. I think <laughs> I'd take that too actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and. Um, do you have any works by George Stubbs? We do not have any paintings by George Stubbs. We do have a, um, a volume in the rare book collection, uh, The Anatomy of the Horse with the original 1766 um, type, the, the, um, the actual text 
from the original version. The engravings that are in it, though, are from 1823. So it's kind of a pastiche of the first edition and then later um, editions of the, of the prints. Fantastic. Um, and I've just had from, I hope this is okay to say, uh, from Jenny Hand, who said, it was lovely to have you visit us and we must do it again. Warm <laughs> wishes, Jenny. Oh, and well, on that, you. thank you so much. That's been, um, it's been a wonderful talk and uh, we, we've really loved it. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Claudia. And it was a wonderful to for you to explain the Munnings exhibition. I mean, your Munnings display, and it points us to the fact that we'll be opening a Munnings exhibition at the Osborne Studio Gallery on the 26th of April. Uh, and then it's going to move to the National Horse Racing Museum on the 24th of May. And all members will be getting an invite shortly. And I call out again to Jenny Hand, who's one of our uh, attendees today and say, we are very grateful for the Minnings Art Museum and for Bill Teveridge, uh, who are supporting us greatly on our exhibition at the moment. Uh, the next talk in our series is going to be on the 7th of April uh, at 11 o'clock, and that's going to be given by Jasper Jennings, and it's on Early Impressions, the printed image of cricket in Georgian England. Um, and Jeff Jasper's very um, entertaining. Uh, he's had 20 years of experience of working with uh, uh, various uh, uh, sporting art collections, and he's currently a, a dealer in London. So that should be a good, good uh, talk as well. So thank you again, Claudia. That was a wonderful, and thank you. Um, I'm sorry about that we had the issues, but you would never know. <laughs> <laughs> you got into it so easily and the technology was wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>